it's Carolyn Glick back again for episode 24 of the Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour. And I'm joined once again, I'm happy to say, by my very good friend and colleague, David Wormser in Washington, D.C. Hey, David. How are you? Good. I'm glad to, I'm glad to be talking to you again. Uh, it was so much fun last so time. Great. And, and uh, we're just going to continue on where we left off. Uh, this time, I think we're going to talk about the two major issues of this week so far. Um, we're, we're recording on a Tuesday night. Are um, the American onslaught against Israel, the Biden administration's enraged response to the news that uh, the Israeli defense minister, Benny Gantz, has listed uh, six uh, Palestinian non non-governmental uh, organizations uh, as as terror front groups for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is a terrorist organization and, and defined as such by the State Department, by the European Union and by Israel. Uh, the European Union has also had an enraged response to the news, not surprising because e, the EU itself and EU member nations uh, have donated millions and millions of dollars to these organizations over the past several years. Uh, so we're going to talk about that a lot and what it what what the uh, Biden administration's rush to defend a uh, six organization with proven ties uh, to a terrorist organization means about the general thrust of the administration's policies towards Israel. And then we're going to move to from there to the uh, to the military coup, to the reorganization of government, however we want to talk about it in Sudan and how that's already impacting um, Sudan's uh, uh, relationship with Israel. Sudan was the fourth uh, Arab state to join the Abraham Accords, or the third, it's the third state actually, uh, and then Morocco came last. Um, and uh, they haven't formalized the agreement yet. There haven't been an exchange, there hasn't been an exchange of ambassadors or an opening up of a Sudanese embassy in Israel, but um, they were moving in that direction, and uh, so we're going to talk about that and uh, and what it means for uh, Africa, what it means for the United States, and most importantly, what it means for uh, the for Israel, at least for our purposes. And uh, and we're going to take it from there. Um, so, David, let's start with the issue of the uh, four. Uh, I'm sorry, of the six. Uh, uh, NGOs that Israel just uh, listed formally as or defined formally as terrorist organizations in the enraged response. I saw that the UN Human Rights Council also today uh, just condemned Israel for uh, designating them terrorist organizations. So that's the UN Human Rights Council, the EU and the and the State Department all coming after Israel for this and demanding uh, explanations. W what do you make of this? Well, if one's judged by one's opponents, Israel's doing pretty good. Yeah. But um, <laughs> at the end of the day, this is this is unbelievable. The PFLP is a terrorist organization. It remained a terrorist organization. It's always been a terrorist organization. These NGOs are definitely part of that structure. They don't hide it. They publish it uh, in their own stuff. Others have published it in their stuff, too. So uh, there, there's no access. I mean, there's no hidden connection here. There's nothing uh, that is ambiguous here. They are essentially uh, elements of the PFLP, which remains the terrorist organization. Um, so first of all, on that level, this is just ridiculous. Uh, the second level that makes it even more uh, dangerous is it's one thing if the United States doesn't want to declare them terrorist organizations, but it's another thing for them to lambast a sovereign other country that labels them terrorist organizations with, in the very least, ambiguous reasons, certainly in my, my view, very clear reasons. Uh, so rather than uh, trying to work this out with the Israelis to take a public stand against Israel is, is truly problematic. The third area that's disturbing is, from everything we're hearing, mm -hmm. is Israel did pre-notify the United States. It did let them know they were going to do this. By the way, this has been discussed with the United States going back six, seven, eight years. This is nothing new. This is not something out of the blue that not suddenly you wake up one day. Uh, the United States knew this. They knew this before. They knew this recently. They discussed it with the Israelis. The Israelis made it clear. So I find this quite surprising that the United States is surprised. I think it's a, a theatrical response rather than a genuine surprise. You know, then, I, oh, go yeah. on, yeah. 
And then the final level is um, to publicly, you know, right now Israel is facing a dangerous situation with Iran, a dangerous situation with Turkey, a dangerous situation with Chinese encroachment in the region, possibly facing another war with Hamas or Islamic Jihad soon, a catastrophically explosive situation in Lebanon. And for the United States to engage in such a harsh public rebuke of its ally, is this really what matters to the United States? Is this really what's important? And I think this goes down to the core of it, which is the animus of this crowd in the White House uh, matters. It matters a lot. I agree. And, you know, I just I want to I want to develop that theme of the animus that the uh, that the Biden administration harbors towards Israel. I think it's important. But there's another aspect of that I still want to pull at, which is this idea that a terrorist organization are only is is comprised only of the trigger shooters. Right. I mean, this is sort of this is an idea that we saw taking root in a really pernicious way uh, after 9-11 where you saw the the Bush administration making, even if it wasn't on purpose, they were they were making distinctions between terrorist organizations and the whole envelope of support that they get around them, whether it was trying to make a difference between see a difference uh, between Al Qaeda and the Taliban when the Taliban and Al Qaeda were 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 two peas in a pod. Um, and or, you know, Hezbollah and the Lebanese government today, even though Hezbollah controls the Lebanese government, it controls the Lebanese military. Um, and you, then you have the military wing of, of uh, Hezbollah and Hezbollah, the civil wing. I mean, and there's no distinction between the two in the eyes of members of either wing. They're all part of the one same organization. And each side, uh, you know, they they're. They're uh, cogs in a wheel. They all work together. And here, too, you have this this weird. It's not even weird. I mean, you have these organizations, Adamir is one, the women's, the Palestinians, women's committees, these agricultural workers. Mm-hmm. They, they have people who are affiliated with these so-called NGOs uh, that are that are sitting in jail for commanding terrorist uh, attacks that murdered Israelis. The most recent one was in 19, 2019. Uh, the Schnerb family was walking to go uh, uh, swimming in a in a stream by their house called uh, called the Danny Stream, and um, they stepped on an IED that was planted by PLFP operatives. Uh, the the father and the son were were critically wounded, and the daughter, sixteen year old Rena Schnerb, was killed. Um, and the person who masterminded that terrorist attack that killed this young teenage girl uh, was the legal advisor for uh, two of the of the NGOs that Israel just designated as PFLP front groups. And yet here, when you have this information, by the way, it was out two years ago. So so part of the question is, why did Israel wait this long? And that's not an unreasonable question. But why would anybody jump to these people's defense? And then you look, NGO Monitor on their on their website has the data specifically about how many hundreds and thousands of dollars and millions of dollars the Ford Foundation, the Open Society uh, Organization, the Norwegian government, the German, German government, the EU, the French government has been transferring to these six organizations um, for multi-year grants, for single-year grants, for specific programs, for general operating budgets, uh, uh, year by year. And so these are organizations that are Western-funded, that are Western directed, that are working openly with with the PFLP terrorist organization. They're of a piece with it. And, you know, this. So, again, the first point is that it it really uh, throws into disarray this artificial uh, distinction that uh, people on the left uh, and the State Department and others have been making for decades uh, between uh, various cogs in the terror wheel and pretending that if you're not actually shooting a trigger and pointing it at, at a civilian, that you're not a terrorist. That, and, and it's just it's not true. And it's a way of 
defining terrorism down to near nothingness, the, the amount of action that you have to take against terrorists really just uh, becomes limited to the point of almost uh, being counterproductive. Yeah, it's, it's like going after Al Capone only by going after the hitman and never touching him. I mean, at, at the end of the day, uh, Arafat played this game uh, with Hamas. He created a climate framework for Hamas to operate. Did he actually order Hamas to do what they needed to do? He didn't have to. He, he gave the signal of the climate that he wanted, and Hamas answered the mail. The, this goes, by the way, back to the Islamic way of war. If you go back to early days of Islam, the commanders of the Islamic forces rarely had the technological means to command tactically forces flung over a thousand kilometers. So what they did was there was a sense of ideological unity uh, with a great deal of latitude given to the local commanders and broad signals would be sent. So they know they're operating on behalf of the armies of Islam. But on the other hand, there didn't need to be positive command and control by the center. And we never understood this is one of the strategic uh, characteristics of the Islamic way of war. It's a legitimate form of warfare. I'm not criticizing it, but it is the way they, they have traditionally operated. And you see this now as the, uh, the, the Hamas never was under the operational control of Arafat, but he was certainly used, or it was certainly used by Arafat and encouraged by Arafat, employed for strategic purposes by Arafat. Well, they had, they, I mean, you're right, but they also had, they also had um, operational agreements. Um, yeah. You know, in 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 1994, Hamas uh, a terrorist cell um, kidnapped uh, Israeli Corporal Nachshon Waxman when he was hitchhiking yeah. a ride back from uh, Tel Shomer uh, military base home to Jerusalem, and they they kidnapped him to the town of Bir Nabala, which is a suburb of Ramallah, in uh, in in the West Bank, north of Jerusalem, and. Uh, the reason why they brought him there, even though in 1994 um, it was still under Israeli security control uh, and not to Jericho or to Gaza, is because earlier that year, Arafat had reached a deal with uh, Sheikh Yassin, the head of Hamas, that Hamas would carry out terrorist operations, but only in areas that hadn't been transferred to Palestinian Authority security control so that Israel wouldn't be able to blame him. So that these were agreements that they reached on an operational level of coordination. And then later in the Palestinian terror war that began in 2000, you had the formation of the Popular Resistance Committee, which were joint Fatah, that is PLO, Palestinian Authority, terror cells together with Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And they were acting, they were operating together in these popular resistance committees and they were carrying out joint operations. So you had a number of terrorist, or, uh, terrorist attacks that were taking place between 2000 and 2004, more or less, that were carried out as joint operations by all three of them. So it's true that there was a general operating Gestalt, you know, sort of a, a, a an idea that everybody that everybody understood, everybody grasped, and everybody cooperated with. But there was yeah. a, a generalized jihad, and you know, a lot of it was also targets of opportunity. But there was also, you know, at various times, and really from the outset of the Palestinian Authority, there were operational agreements. A lot of them were not, not wink, wink, but a lot of them were yeah. pretty explicit between Fatah and, and Arafat and Sheikh Yassin and Muhammad Def uh, from yes, Hamas. That, absolutely. Look, I mean, the, the, there were constant meetings and so forth. It, it gets to the second part of your question, which was the United States after 1991 right. and this, uh, 2001. And the, uh, this was the fissure. This was the fissure that defined the schizophrenia of the mm -hmm. Bush administration which is you had one half of the administration uh, led by Colin Powell and Richard Armitage, who wanted to look at terror in a traditional way, which is the way that we're describing here, which is, did the Taliban really know? Eh, not so sure. Uh, was there a larger framework of states in the region that controlled 
uh, Al-Qaeda and therefore can be held accountable for its behavior? In their view, no. Al-Qaeda was a police action. It was a non-governmental organization. It should be dealt with in purely a criminal way. Namely, you go after operatives and you try to work your way up the structure, but it's limited to Al-Qaeda. And then there was the second half of the administration that said that the entirety of the Arab world to some extent and particularly half of the Arab world in, in, in a great extent, had used the atmosphere and the, and the tactics of terror mm -hmm. uh, as a strategic weapon for many decades, it was inherent to their ideologies and the framework of their governments, and that you can't deal with the phenomenon of terror, which was becoming, which was overflowing from the region and increasingly threatening the West in a, in a genuine way. You can't you can't deal with that threat unless you deal with the, the climate of the nations who legitimize it, fund it, nurture it, support it as part of the whole structure. Uh, did, for example, uh, Saddam or Khamenei or Assad or Gaddafi or any of these guys actually order Al Qaeda to do it? No, they, they didn't. They didn't need to. They simply were part of this abysmal world of terror supporters. Right. And you're not going to deal with them until you can. And they would pull off the shelf some of these units from Ver Abu Nidal or whatever, whenever it suited them, they could employ them. And, and, and so at the end of the day, this whole attempt to deal with terrorism in a legalistic, most narrow, most restrictive way is precisely the structure that the terrorists and their strategic supporters want you to work in. You're never going to defeat it that way. And, and, and so I think you, you, you see it now playing out once again with this PFLP and geo question is, of course, they're part of it. They're, part, they're actually a very important strategic part of the PLO's lawfare, warfare, terror fair campaign against Israel. Uh, so you can't win that war unless you take on these NGOs. The fact that the West has fallen prey to it, uh, well, I'm not sure that it's, I think there's some willingness to fall prey to it. The fact that Germans are supporting these NGOs and Germans and, and, and Europeans are supporting uh, construction in Area C of Palestinian uh, activities and trying to change the facts on the ground, the very thing they accuse Israel of, by the way. Uh, th 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 there's something there that makes them complicitous as well. So I don't think the EU is an in innocent bystander in any shape or mean at this point. They are complicitous in the building that, of terrorist structures against Israel. And well, that, really, that really brings me to, you know, what you were saying before. I just wanted to, you know, make that uh, point that, you know, that this is just part of a larger whole, that you have yeah. the environments of terrorism, the 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 operating, the operating um, surrounding or whatever you want to like the neighborhood that the terrorism that the terrorism comes from, that it's part of, that supports it, all of the the money, the support infrastructure, everything. I mean, it's just it's a whole it's like a it's like a universe of terror. It's the ideology, ideological perspective. It's a financial, it's a political, it's a, and it's the military, but it's all of it. It's a bookkeeping um, and. And so after before we talked about we were talking about how obscene this is and what it really means about the animus that the Biden administration harbors towards Israel. And we've seen it with people like Mahir Bitar, who's the uh, director for intelligence in the National Security Council, yeah. who was a BDS activist uh, when he was in at Georgetown University. You have a You have a, a handful of senior people at the White House who have outspoken records of supporting uh, the boycott of Israel and its supporters in the United States. You have um, you have uh, Hadi Amar, who's the point man for Israel and the Palestinians at the State Department, who uh, Tony Blinken intends to appoint uh, as consul general to the Palestinians in Israel's capital city, Jerusalem, as soon as possible. Um, and he, too, has a long history of support for Hamas, for the Palestinian Authority and and hatred towards Israel. Uh, and these are the people who are running the, the Biden administration's policies towards Israel and really uh, on a on a basic level of 
hatred towards his essential rejection of its right to exist, of the Jewish people's right to self-determination in their homeland, they're not easy to distinguish from Rashida Tlaib, from Ilhan Omar, and all of their comrades on the Hill and on the far left of the Democratic uh, caucus, uh, again, on in, in, in Congress and then in, in the larger party. Um, and I, but I don't, they're not alone. I mean, like you said, I'm just looking at right now at the NGO monitor report of the of the funding. So Defense of Children International Palestine gets money from the Rockefeller Brothers, from the Basque Agency for Development, uh, from uh, the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation, from Norway, and we're talking about millions and tens of millions of dollars from Sweden, and then uh, the the. Agricultural workers, cooperatives, they get 15.6 million from Canada. Uh, they from multiple French governmental bodies. They get from uh, I don't know. They get from from Norway, 70 million crowns. They I, I, just huge and huge amounts of money. Netherlands gave them one 11.3 million. El Haq. 800,000 from Soros's Open Society Foundation. I mean, these are these are, this is real money, as my grandmother would say, you know, Sweden, yeah. 7.2 million, so on. And so I mean, these these are all they're all getting extraordinary budgets and uh, yeah. the Belgians are in on it. So you're looking the at way, these the Israeli what? left, the far left in Israel also gets an enormous amount of money from abroad because they don't really have any domestic support. So right. The Israeli need- left is basically all one big foreign agent because they, they would there wouldn't have any presence whatsoever in public life in Israel if it weren't for the millions that they're receiving from the Europeans and from the American yep. Jewish left. Yeah, yep. so it, it's it's absolutely true. And, and then you see that you have these Israeli leftists who are coming to the defense of these Palestinian uh, terror front organizations. And at the end of the day, you can say, well, maybe it's all about money because since they're getting, they're drinking from the same well. And uh, so clearly uh, they're, they're also being asked to defend uh, their fellow grantees from the French uh, government, from the EU, from the German government, from the Swedish government and so on, from the Ford foundation um, and from the open society foundation. So it's true. You have this universe of donors that are supporting this universe of terror that are also supporting uh, Israeli uh, radical groups and political parties that uh, that exist. All of them exist by this money. And then that really raises the question, well, who's who's pulling the strings, as 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 you might say, in the war against Israel? I mean, how how lethal would this war be? What would the threat environment Israel faces look like if the Europeans weren't obsessive in their support for the Palestinian war against Israel on all you know political levels, whether it's Israelis subversion or whether it's Palestinian Authority or Hamas or these front organizations for terrorist organizations. And actually, you had direct funding of the PFLP itself from some of the European governments until they were exposed last year. You have the U- U.S. government doing the same You have, under the Biden administration through US, USAID. And then you have all of these uh, multi-billion dollar foundations like the Ford Foundation and the Open Society um, Fund from Soros and, and others that are pouring still more millions and millions of dollars of one Israel fund from the American Jewish left. Are they running the show? What do you see as their role in well, this? Well, I, I see the European elite certainly being uh, the EU being certainly uh, deeply involved at the highest levels with all this, and certainly somewhat of a of an organizing factor here. Uh, th- there's uh, an obsession that affects European elites with the Palestine issue. It, it is un- inexplicable, other than through uh, through the situation, it's inexplicable through the situation. It has to be explained through other means. Israel represents for them something that they find so deeply offensive that this matters to them more than virtually any other thing. They've prioritized this issue and surrendered self interests over this issue, um, and that raises the question of what is it exactly that Israel tweaks in their minds that is so offensive, so horrific that it makes Israel in their minds much, much worse than say North Korea, 
And by the way, they set the tone for their own populations. When you see polls in Britain and other places that say that uh, Israelis are seen to be the most offensive people on the face of the earth, and that Israel is seen by uh, as the most aggressive and uh, destabilizing country in the world, even more than North Korea or Iran, uh, they, the population gets this signal from its elites, from its governments and the elites who run them and the old aristocracies in Europe. And I think that there's something there. The there there, I believe, is that Israel represents something. So it's, Jews ultimately represented something deeply offensive to the sort of politics that you see the European Union embracing. These ideologues and the European Union is based on an ideology. I wouldn't let their momentary democratic demeanor fool you. They are ideologues. They are ideologues that emerge from the French Revolution. And there's something deeply offensive about the nature of Judaism and the existence of Judaism to these elites. And it has a lot to do with some of the fundamental values that are embedded in Judaism and were absorbed by Christianity in the United States, precisely why many American elites throughout the last two, 300 years were so favorable to Jews, because it touched something deep in the American soul. It's touching something deep in the European soul, except the European soul is uh, on a fu fundamentally different foundation and its elites are hostile to the ideas that Israel represents and that embody the United States. So the more Israel succeeds, the more frustrated and angry they become at Israel because it shows them, uh, it exposes them at the end of the day. So I'm not surprised at all that they're involved with uh, funding activities that are, uh, deeply violating Israel's sovereignty, first of all, two, uh, assisting a strategic attack on Israel, and three, re-raise the issues of 1948, namely the fundamental question as to whether it was a good idea to have Israel created again. I think it actually uh, raises the fundamental issue of 1939 through 1945. Unfortunately, yes. Whether, whether No, I, I, I remember I... I um... I heard a story years ago, and it's been repeated to me since that in 1967, on the eve of the Six Day War, there was this sense of foreboding of Holocaust dimensions, right, that uh, Israel yeah. was about to just be annihilated by the Egyptians and and the other Arab forces that were, were was, uh, you know, were getting were priming themselves for war against Israel and that in Holland, they took up this uh, impassioned collection of blankets and other things for all of the Jewish refugees that were going to suddenly uh, uh, be shipped off to uh, Europe, back to Europe, and they were going to accept them all. And they had all these blankets that had been donated by the good people of Holland. Uh, well, by the way, those were, those were the optimists. The pessimists didn't think there were going to be any refugees. <laughs> Okay, so there you go. But so they so they were saying we're gonna we're gonna protect these poor Jews after they're forced to to leave uh, to leave the land of Israel after their country's been annihilated, and um, when Israel won after you know in in a six day miracle right this extraordinary victory this of epic proportions um, that the victory was greeted with with disbelief. But then that disbelief was replaced with rage yeah. because the thing that they could not accept was not that the Jews would be refugees and miserable and need them to protect them. You know, a la, you know, St. Augustine, right, who said we were supposed to be the miserable uh, artifact of uh, of uh, of the people who God had spurned when he started a new covenantal relationship with with Jesus and and with the Christians. Um, but instead, we came roaring back to life, and and we and we were able to defeat our enemies in this in this victory, and that wasn't supposed to happen. We were supposed to we that there was sort of the it was it was a it was a crisis of theology. It was a theological crisis that the Jews had had destroyed their expectations, had 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 um, disappointed them in such an extraordinary way because not, we, not only were we not refugees, we were victors, and, and that was just never supposed to happen. And yeah. when you add 
add to that theological castigation of Jews and desire to see Jews immiserated and impoverished and, and in need of somebody's and in need of the kindness of strangers to the uh, the the Marxist uh, element uh, uh, that was that was ex- you know being expressed and being embraced by the European elites after sixty seven, then then you really get it's you you you're on you're on the train or whatever you're you're on your road to where we've come to today, which is you know Tuvia Tannenbaum who's uh, he's a bit of a, uh, you know, he, he the right. He's a writer, and he he's um, what's the word? He's like a provocateur. You know, he goes in, he pretends that he's a German, and he talks to all the Palestinians, and he yes. presents himself as a as a German uh, journalist, and then they all think that they're talking to a German and not to a, a Jew, and they tell him what they really think of all the Jews, and then he writes it all down in these in these stories, and so. He he didn't he did a book several years ago about the Palestinians in Israel and his conclusion from everything that he went through and all the Palestinians met with Palestinian leaders. He met with Palestinian NGO people. He met with European donors. He met with European journalists and everybody thought that they were talking to a German reporter and uh, one of them. And he discovered or he concluded that the Palestinian war against Israel is not an Arab part of the Arab Israeli conflict is a continuation of Europe's war against the Jews. And yeah. I, and I think that there's a lot of truth to that. And when you look at, at what's happening with the American left, they, they're becoming the American elites are becoming Europeanized. And, uh, and, yeah, very, and much so. yes. uh, very much so, you know, uh, it, it, in the end, there was a second shift also. One was the 67 war when Israel, God forbid, won actually and survived, according to that, that view of the world. The, the Jews, Jews um, obviously were much more likable as victims. So it was difficult. But there was a second level, which was when Begin was elected in 77, because there was still some residual uh, feeling that the Jews had created a, a socialist utopia of sorts. There was this romantic view in Europe of the kibbutz and, and so forth. And it, with the Soviet Union, obviously, after 68, being the bete noir of the socialist movement, one forgets, until 1968, European socialists looked up to the Soviet Union. Afterwards, with the crushing of Czechoslovakia, uh, they, uh, they, there was a big break between the so- socialist movements of Europe and, and Russia. Uh, and, and so they were looking to validate their socialism without the framework of Russia. Of course, China was one area, but the second area was, uh, was liberation movements. And then third, of course, was, was Israel. Uh, it was an uncomfortable triad to begin with. But Israel quickly fell off because socialism was not working in Israel as, it, as, as the myth had tried to project. And uh, Israel was moving to a fundamentally different place. So as it did, Israel did the unforgivable sin of moving away from socialism and done it successfully. So in that sense, Israel's this horrific uh, counterpoint to the socialist world's uh, viewpoint. Then there's the issue of nationalism. Mm-hmm. And, and and liberal nationalism and the fact that Israel represents a strong identity. Uh, it's not a religion. It's not a nation. It's a civilization unto itself. Civilizations don't have to be a billion people. In Israel's case, in the Jewish people's case, it's only, it's only 10 to 15, 20 million people. But it's an independent civilization. The third area, which I think is not properly appreciated, gets a little bit to your story about the Dutch Jews and their blankets. Uh, because we're seeing this play out with the American Jewish community now. There has been a fundamental inversion in Judaism in the last uh, 70 years that has been, or well, it's really the last 20, 30 years, which is, you know, coming out of World War II, uh, realistically speaking, the Jewish community of Israel was straggling. It was a remnant literally pulled from the ashes. It was fighting for its life by the skin of its teeth. It was poor as, as heck because it couldn't take money from where it come from and it was fighting wars and the land didn't give itself easily to a lot of wealth. So at the end of the day, Israel was this tiny little boat attached to American Judaism. 
And America was the center of Jewish life internationally after World War II. And that's the way the American Jewish community, and that's the way most Jewish communities looked at Israel. It was always the little brother to everybody, uh, the one that we have to help, the poor cousin. Uh, and the United States Jewry still looks at it this way, but there's been this great inversion that's happened, which is Judaism is returning to its roots, which is Israel is becoming once again, the center of global Judaism. It is now population demography wise, the, the uh, half the Jewish population of the entire world. But if you look at publication, religious thought, economic activity, uh, it is becoming the sun around which Jewish communities around the world, including the United States Jewish community revolves for survival, by the way, from assimilation and whatever, and sometimes occasionally physical survival. This is an uncomfortable circumstance for American Judaism. They have not reconciled to this reversal of roles. And I think there's a lot of uh, problems that emerge from that. The other thing that comes from that is that Judaism, for the first time in 2,000 years, has been empowered. It's been living for 2,000 years in this bizarre, suspended state of animation that uh, had nothing to do with power. Mining ancient Jewish culture, the wisdom of the Jews that emerged over 2,000 years before the destruction of the temple, that was the job of the Christians. Machiavelli, others deeply studied the Bible, they pulled from it values, ideas, and they created a Western civilization that stood on two pillars, the power of Rome and the values and the, and the soul of, of, of Jerusalem. Uh, Jews had it. I mean, we had that within ourselves, but this was the, the Christian way of handling it. What you have now is Christianity is increasingly delegitimized as a foundation for Western values. At the same time that Judaism is increasingly reappreciated as a, as a cultural foundation and for those who believe a faithful a faith foundation for Jewish empowerment again. So you have the two ships literally crossing like that where political thought now that is dealing with the issue of ethics and the Judeo-Christian culture is, is emerging in Israel. They're grappling with these issues, only beginning to, but they're grappling with these issues, whereas the Ju Jerusalem pillar of the West is being rapidly delegitimized. So this is another source of tremendous irritation for the European elites because they had spent so much effort to delegitimize that Jerusalem core of Western civilization. And here it's emerging in Israel. And I mean, they also did a lot to delegitimize the Roman uh, uh, column of yes, the pillar too. of Western yeah. civilization. I mean, through yeah. through the whole anti-colonial, co colonialist, anti-imperialist studies and 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 uh, and obsession really of Western elites with their own yeah. with their own evil past of racism and imperialism and colonialization. So they also wanted to make Israel into one of their yeah. mini means. And uh, even though we had no mother country, they pretended that Israel, they still do. I mean, the concept of Zionism being a form of colonialism or imperialism is utterly insane. But they say that too, because it's part of this, uh, you know, well, we're delegitimizing ourselves, we're delegitimizing Rome and Jerusalem, and we're delegitimizing Jerusalem as Rome, and we're delegitimizing Rome as Jerusalem or something, and it's all just this one big gobbledygook. And, but I think I think that what, what we, we do see, though, is that, you know, when, when you look at the Arab world and you see that, over, you know, since uh, the so-called Arab Spring in 2010 and 11, 12, 13, and then you're having this counter revolutions and counter revolutions and counter coups. You had it in Algeria, and now you have it in Sudan. Obviously, you had it before, and in Tunisia and in Egypt, and all of these countries that were that were the focal points of the of the revolutions, the early supposedly democracy revolutions that brought to power the Muslim Brotherhood are now having, you know, counter revolutions and just ongoing. Um, and you have an Arab world that has become exhausted over the past decade or so with the war against the Jewish state and that the baton has really been passed. And not that the Arabs passed, I don't think they care that much, but it has been grasped by the West that as they go down, you know, I mean, it, I, 
they're trying desperately to take Israel down with it. And, um, you know, what you were saying about the American Jewish community, I think is very true. When you look at the discomfort that the American Jewish uh, uh, leadership had on so many levels with Israel and with Zionism, both predating the establishment of Israel and then after Israel was established until around 1967, when Israel became so popular with the with America within American society, within the wider American society, that the Jewish groups all just became very Zionist. Now you're seeing the same level of discomfort and trying to reimagine Judaism to be something completely different. And it's mainly mm-hmm. about victimization at the hands of others and not about the Torah and Jewish heritage. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's really disturbing. I'll just give you one example. I was watching um, Fox News uh, uh, earlier today, and they said that the Anti-Defamation League, which used to be until, you know, fairly recently, a an organization, a Jewish organization whose, whose job was to fight anti-Semitism in the United States uh, and around the world, for that matter, just put out a statement uh, telling parents that when they're thinking about what Halloween costume to buy for their children, that they really have to be sensitive. And they gave some specific examples. They said that you should not dress your children as princesses and princes or as superheroes because that could really offend people from, I don't know, who don't, who feel like a princess is is saying that they have some sort of cultural supremacy or something or who superheroes mean is a form of ableism, that it means that people who are healthy and strong are better than people who aren't. And and I, I mean, you can take issue. I certainly do with this whole insanity of telling children that they shouldn't dress up as uh, as as princes and princesses and superheroes for Halloween. Um, but whether you agree with it or not, that wasn't the job of the ADL. And I think that the idea that the Anti-Defamation League has reinvented itself as a generally just a progressive organization, a progressive pressure group uh, in the United States is part and parcel with a redefinition of Zy- of Judaism in the United States by the American Jewish community to basically be uh, just, you know, the Democrats with bagels. Look, I mean, here, uh, let's be real. The the ADL now sees it as a core mission to pronounce on pagan symbolism. And be, what? <laughs> the, what? The, uh, the ADL apparently now believes the core uh, mission is to pronounce on pagan symbolism. Halloween is a pagan holiday. And now, I, I mean, what role they have in this is beyond me. I'm not sure why they're even playing a role here. That's not, that's not what they're there for. That's not they, what they were supposed to be about. The second thing is uh, Halloween is, uh, you know, when, when you get to children under 12 years old, Halloween's a holiday that 12 year olds and under really celebrate more than anybody. Right. These are intimate relations between parents and their kids. Uh, you know, one doesn't tread into these areas lightly and they do, and they did. Uh, so I, I, this is offensive on so many levels. And then again, it's the same thing like with the Iran nuclear program and so forth. We have anti-Semitism exploding in the United States. The AJC just put out a report. I think it was the AJC just yeah, today. We- the, 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 it is, uh, expresses, you know, a horrific collapse of security of Jews in the United States in the last few months and years. Uh, this concurs with all other reports we've seen. The ADL was created precisely to address this question, and this is not the question they're addressing. Instead, they're talking about whether it's proper for a little girl to wear a princess costume on a pagan holiday. That It just shows how much they have lost their way. Uh, it just it, It's beyond me. It's beyond me that they still pretend to be what they think they are. Uh, so- yes, but in Israel, see, they, they have an office in Israel. And in Israel, they've made it their their cause to uh, champion the rights of illegal aliens from Eritrea and Sudan who are who are trying to you know colonize uh, the working class neighborhoods of Tel Aviv, right? And and um, they're demanding that Israel provide free health care, free free schooling, free everything, and ultimately citizenship for these people who are 
have absolutely no right to be in this country. And they stole across the border from Egypt or whatever. And, and then, uh, and and then proceeded to just settle down and not move with the help of these American Jewish organizations that are funding wanna, them and that are championing them. Well, they want to be part of this leftist global in crowd, you know, whether it's the ACLU, the ADL, the ADL wants to be part of the ACLU, Amnesty International. They want to be part of that hip leftist progressive crowd. But that tells you who they are now. They're not an objective organization whose concern is the defense of the Jewish community and Jewish interests. They are a, prog a progressive organization bending the Jewish community in a specific direction. Uh, you know, it's funny public. because the, the, the Sudanese who are the illegal alien Sudanese who are living in Tel Aviv and in Eilat in Israel, are probably the only Sudanese that these people really care about because right now, you know, you have a situation where the U.S. government, by the way, while we were talking, it was just reported in Israel that the United States, the U.S. ambassador or charged affairs, whatever they have here now, uh, just issued a formal protest at the, to the prime minister's office, but Israel's plans to build 1,300 homes for Israeli Jews in Judea and Samaria. So, you know, this is what what the United States cares most deeply about right now, uh, not not anything else. This is what everybody's fixated on is uh, Jews in Judea and Jews in Jerusalem and uh, Jews going after Palestinian terrorists. Um, that that's what really is is keeping American diplomats busy and awake and concerned and angry uh, in the middle of the night. Um, but Sudan itself, um, as we, as I said at the outset, when we were talking about it, you know, they just had this uh, essentially a military uh, coup where they have a they have a government. They had a transition government. They ousted uh, Bashir Omar Bashir, who was this Islamist who was in charge of Sudan since 1979. In 2019, he was an Al Qaeda supporter. He harbored Al Qaeda beginning un until what was it, 1995, when they decamped to Afghanistan, and um, he was a massive supporter of terrorism. Um, he was ousted in 2019 uh, by the military, and then they put together this transitional government that was half military, half civilian, and they're supposed to transition into something else, uh, and the um, in the meantime, the people who were driving the normalization of ties between Sudan and Israel last year were the people, were the military element of this transitional government. And those people, including, I think his name is Borkan, who's the, the sort of chief of general staff, um, who is the head of this coup, uh, was the one who met with Prime Minister, then Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu, and with Israel Intelligence Minister Eli Cohen. And um, the civilian prime minister who was just ousted was is a is an economist, but the civilian elements inside of the government were from the most developed uh, parties, such as they were after 30 years of dictatorship in Sudan, which was the Baathists and the communists. So um, they, this is what's happening in Sudan, and the United States responded to uh, Borkan's uh, ouster of the prime minister and of the civilian elements from the government uh, by blocking $700 million in U.S. Uh, uh, economic aid to Sudan, and then most notably by urging Israel to end the process of normalizing its relations with, with Khartoum. And I found that stunning. Uh, why would this be the top, you know, thing on America's to-do list when they wish to express their displeasure with the internal political developments uh, in Sudan? Why would they say, okay, Israel, well, you can't be friends with them anymore? I think in some ways that, that explains it, which is uh, that the Sudanese government apparently crossed the red line uh, along with the Moroccan government to some extent. The hostility here toward the Abraham Accords from the progressive side, and unfortunately even the larger left, the ones who are more traditionally liberal and not progressive, is, uh, 
it bordered on some level of jealousy, but maybe more, it was just simply because Trump did it, they couldn't give it to him. They couldn't let him have that victory. So there was a hostility from day one, stunning hostility from day one here on the left side of the spectrum toward the Abraham Accords. And I think part of this is that Sudan became part of that, as did Morocco. So those are the weak links, the low hanging fruit, and they're beginning to literally reverse the Abraham Accords. So that's one thing. The second thing is earlier in my career, I was deeply identified with the freedom agenda in the region. Uh, and I did have a lot of uh, Arab contacts and friends who were truly, truly liberal. I mean, uh, in, the, in the classic sense of the word, democratic. Uh, and, but much to my dismay, much to my sadness, they're not a critical mass in the Arab world. Uh, the progressive forces, the forces of of progress, not progressive in the American sense, but true forces of progress in the, in the region often are the militaries in these countries. And if you looked in the long term for some fundamental change in the Arab world, I think you're going to have to look at either the self-interest of tribes, which is what you're seeing in places like the UAE, which is solid, or transformations of more urban populations by uh, the military including, by the way, in Turkey. So I, I, I think that we're, we're missing the point here. As far as the freedom agenda goes, I, I remember sitting down one day with Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick before she passed away. And I was talking with her about Iraq and the prospects for freedom there and whether she'd sign a letter under the Clinton administration supporting uh, an effort to support the Iraqi opposition against the government. And she looked at me, and it's the only time I ever saw her really dejected and pessimistic. And she said, well, one, I don't believe Washington can get it right. So I fear what it might involve. And two, and she said this with the utmost seriousness, the Arab world tries my faith in the universality of the human aspiration of freedom. Um, she didn't want to sign on to the freedom agenda in the region. This is the lady, the woman, the great leader who defined herself in the Cold War as a voice of freedom, couldn't sign on. And I think that we have to come to terms with the fact, with the Arab world, that there are other forces at work that we have to work with uh, that represent and help represent our interests and, frankly, ultimately, even our values more than what we would think. It's not, it's not the Arab street right now. It's not some populist upheaval that is the voice of freedom or democracy. I think it's a slow slog to get to a different Arab world. And it will take structures like the tribal structures and the military to get there. We try to go some other way. I think we're gonna cause more trouble than it's, than it's helping. And we become a problem in the region and not a help. And we don't advance human rights anyway that way. You know, I think you're right. And I also think that the United States itself is in the middle of an identity crisis about what it is, who it is, what its values are, what it believes in. Um, and it's hard to see how you can then say, well, at this time where our values change every time that we have a change in government in Washington and the things that we we value and the things that we're advancing are completely reversed depending on you know who who wins and who loses it's hard in that kind of instability to be saying well, well what we want to do is advance american values you know the democracy agenda the democracy peace theory that democracies don't go to war against each other was you know upon investigation or upon implementation in places like iraq and afghanistan and the Palestinian Authority and Egypt and, and Tunis, Tunisia and, and a lot of other countries over the past decade. Uh, what it shows is that democracy as a form of government is simply saying that whatever the majority wants is going to be in charge. And yeah. the, majority, uh, the majority doesn't always want what uh, people who live in uh in the United States, uh, as you know, majority of Americans would want, or a majority of Israelis would want, you know, and, you know, and people fun... can't really figure that one out. It's not, it's it's. There's a whole lot of stuff that goes into making a liberal democracy, and yeah. elections. It's just it's just the end point. It's not the beginning point. And and when 
I think the point that I wanted to make here is that for me, the question of shared values is important on a personal level, but I think that on a national level, the most important thing, particularly when we're in these kinds of stormy waters at home and abroad, is interests. You know, do you share our interests? And then that, you know, what it, and if the Muslim Brotherhood regime in in Egypt had managed to take root and 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 um and take over the national institutions as it was planning through the constitution that they were writing, which is a jihadist document, had they been able to, to, to do everything that they were planning, then there would never have then, then the southern then the southern front between Israel and Egypt would have been reignited very, very quickly. And the peace accord between Israel and Egypt would have been thrown into the dustbin of history and it would have been a nightmare. So Israel and the Egyptian military had a profound joint interest in overthrowing the Morsi regime, the Muslim Brotherhood regime in Egypt. And the Americans were looking at uh, Sisi and the Egyptian armed forces that over, overthrew him as a coup d'etat that had to be stopped and it was a, and it was anti-democratic and and they they couldn't they didn't know what to do and for years uh, they were pushing the Egyptians away. And now Egypt, half of their military purchases are from Russia. That's right. That's right. You've got it exactly right. Um, you know, at, at the end, I, I just, I can't quite grasp the self-destructive behavior the West is engaged with, with all this. Uh, you, first of all, just to go back a minute or two on what you said, the uh, freedom and democracy are two fundamentally different things. They're related, but they're not the same thing. There is no freedom in the Arab world. Democracy without freedom, without certain structures, is nothing but mob rule. It's what we saw in the French Revolution and the guillotines and the thousands of people put to death by beheading and got in place de la Concorde and so forth. This is mob rule is democracy without the structure of freedom underneath. It's not only the last step, but it is the least important step of freedom. What you have in the Middle East is still Democracy turns out mob rule, which means minorities get crushed, minority voices get annihilated. This is not liberal. This is not free. This is this is totalitarian. And and uh, yet Washington seems to confuse these two subjects and think if there's a government that has some nominal form of democracy, a parliament or a civilian, go we think it means something. And it doesn't. It doesn't mean any more than Robespierre was the voice of freedom. So uh, it, 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 is, it is delusional in the West. And, it's a, and it betrays the fact that the American elites do not understand their own foundations and the difference between those foundations in 1776 and the French Revolution, which are two fundamentally different yep. human events, one leading to the Soviet Union and Chinese communism and Nazi Germany, and the other one leading to the United States, as we know it. So it's, it's really a, an awful situation um, that the American elites are peddling the very ideas that they rebelled against 200 years ago and saw with horror. In, 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 in 1790, in the 1790s. You know, and I think that in a way, I, this was, I was saying this last year and I was a little bit more hopeful then because now, because we had a different government in charge in Israel, we had a different government in charge in the United States. But the fact is, you know, I mean, w when you look at, at the assault on the Abraham Accords, which were really the end of the Israeli-Arab conflict. Right? I mean, that, that's what they spelled. They spelled the end of the Arab conflict yes. with Israel. And then what you're left with is this Palestinian conflict. And when you look at its component parts and you look at who's behind it, and you look who has an interest in prolonging it and perpetu not, not just perpetuating it, but at the end of the day, bringing about Israel's demise, it's not the Arabs first and foremost. It's the Europeans no. and it's the international left and now the Democrat Party and the Biden administration, which has this obsessive compulsive need to uh, delegitimize Israel's very right to exist. And every aspect of its national interests that it pursues, whether it's through Jewish building, whether it's through outlawing terrorist organizations, whether it's through... Uh, uh, developing strategic ties with Sudan, which, you know, just look at the map and see where it is. You know, I, I'm looking at my map right now. It's it's right. It's right at the end of the Red Sea and going into the Gulf of Aden. 
I mean, these are this is an extremely important piece of real estate, and uh, Israel has a profound interest in good ties with the Sudanese on 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 levels that have very little to do with dem- diplomacy, and uh, and mm-hmm. and uh, and and they shouldn't be foregone because the person who's been most responsible for advancing the joint interests of the Sudanese uh, ruling class and the and the state of Israel is now. Uh, is now taking steps to 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 strengthen his hold on power in Khartoum. And so when you look and you see that the Arab-Israeli conflict essentially ended last year and that people who are prolonging it are in the West, then that really goes to the heart of the question or, or the heart of the issue that you mentioned. And I talked about it much more last year because, I, again, I think I was feeling more hopeful, which is the fact that Judaism is a civilization. And that it stands on its own, and and you know people always are surprised how Jews can reinvent themselves. You know, in every era of our time, Mark Stein once had a great article about anti-Semitism years ago, but I still remember it, saying how you know Jews uh, move from one one thing to another, and they keep adapting to the way that the world adapts, to the way that the world changes and develops. And that's one of this one of the secrets of of the of the Jewish people's ability to survive for so many thousands of years in exile and in horrific conditions. And I think that that's true, but I also think it's because if if you are a self-contained civilization, then you have the ability to do many different things as a people. And so whether, you know, on on all different kinds of levels, so no matter what the stress and the pull is that you're able to adapt. And I think that, you know, right now, the thing that Israel has to adapt itself to is an is an is a, is an increasingly clear reality where the people who are the where the war against Israel is, is being waged by by Europe that they are the masters of this war and uh, and that Israel has to organize itself in, in the face of but that it's, fact. It's, yeah. it's a war against itself. Europe is destroying its own foundations. I mean, they're, they're, the, the Judaism gave the world three things. Uh, first of all, was was outright that, that monotheism is conceived of by by uh, Abraham, apparently also by by others like like Elimelech and so forth, but Abraham most clearly uh, was the abstraction of God. We gave the world the concept of abstraction. The second thing we gave the world was at, at, at Mount Moriah with the Akidat Yitzchak, with the uh, almost sacrifice of Isaac, was the clear understanding that human life belongs to God, not to other men. And that therefore taking and giving human life and shaping man's character is a, is the divine prerogative, not ours. So that takes off the table these radical ideologies that try to reshape the nature of man, like the French Revolution, communism. Was. And the third thing was in Mount Sinai, when the Torah unified uh, the tribes into one nation. Uh, it was the first modern nation, essentially, that was built right then and there. So those three things... In Dostoevsky, in his one of his books, The Demons, Jesty, he described a scene where there was this anarchist, a proto-Lenin type figure, and he describes what he needs to do to create totalitarianism. And he goes, he openly talks about the process of Mount Sinai and the, the wandering in the desert, and he reverses the direction. He talks about going to Mount Sinai and doing away with the law, then creating chaos and removing the abstraction, and then creating the demand for the Pharaoh and so on and so forth. What, what you have here in European ideology, leftist European ideology, is the desperate need to take the three pillars of Judaism that we, we gave the world and destroy them. The, the use of, of, of nationhood through law, the uh, removal of, um, of, of man from the prerogative of God uh, or putting him into the prerogative of God and keeping him there and removing it from man playing with man. And then finally the abstraction and creating a physical tangible cult of personality that you can visibly see, have images of and, and, and pray to and, and bow to. Those three things are, 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 are highly offensive 
to the way the global left sees the world. And as a, as a result, there's no reconciliation ultimately between the symbolism and the, and the spirit of Judaism as a civilization with global leftist thought. You're right. And and then the question becomes, well, uh, can the Jews be safe uh, so long as, uh, you know, th this is going on? And I'm thinking here, you know, like you look um, in uh, in Europe, Europe is very rapidly Islamized. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, yeah. through through uh, Merkel's mass uh, migration uh, policies from uh, the from the Islamic world into Europe over the past generation. Um, you see a total transformation of European society. There are places in Germany, for instance, where uh, Islam has become the dominant, the dominant uh, culture in German cities like Cologne and others. And you have, I mean, you had the, the Cathedral of Notre Dame was just destroyed and nobody essentially said anything about why or how or who did it. Uh, how did that happen? You have priests being beheaded in Normandy inside of a church and nobody doing anything about that either. Um, and so they're going after the Jews almost. I mean, it, it's like I see the American Jewish community also collapsing with intermarriage and with uh, with with embrace of uh, progressivism, which is inherently anti-Semitic along the lines that we talked about with Peter Beinart, but with so many others uh, in the United States as they collapse. Uh, they go after the Jews. They go after Israel. They go after Orthodox Jews. Now they're waging war on on the uh, Kotel, on the Western Wall, and they want to remake it as a as a reform synagogue, which I guess nobody will go to because they're all empty. But uh, you know, they 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 go to these great lengths to go after uh, if they're non-Jews and to go after the Jewish state if they're if they're post post Jewish Jews, you know, progressive Jews, it's to go after the Orthodox edifice of Israel, to go after the nationalist edifice of Israel. Uh, so specific specific bad Jews that they don't like, but that it's all at a time when they themselves are collapsing. And so then the question is, how is this going to play out over time? I mean, is is the as, is this going to be the last thing that they do? I mean, I always feel like they're trying to be like Samson, only it's all reversed. Instead of Samson being the Jew, Samson is the Philistine, and he's trying to bring the Jewish house down on with him. That he can't possibly, yeah. he can't possibly go down without bringing bringing the the people of Israel down with him. Well, this is the clash of civilizations, but the real one. I don't think Samuel Huntington got it right. I don't think it was between. The various uh, parts. Well, it was to some extent, but Samuel Huntington, who never appreciated Judaism as a civilization, by the way, but I think he missed the point that the real clash of civilizations is within Western civilization at this point. It was already apparent at his time. It was emerging. It was just hard to see. It's 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 glaring now. There's an there's an outright attempt to do, when when one tears down statues and erases history books and rewrites them. One is erasing who one is. Right. One is erasing the foundations that make you who you are, which means you are not that anymore. Uh, and that is what's going on here, whether it's Peter Beinart saying Judaism essentially was one big fraud before Yavne and the destruction of the temple, or however he would craft it, he erases Jewish history as a nation, as a people, as a civilization before that. Or whether it's the tearing down of the Columbus statues and the Junipio Serra uh, statues out in L.A. or so forth and so on, there is this war assault on what makes us one civilization. And we saw it also with the concept of patchwork versus melting pot. I, I, what binds us together, the ties or what Lincoln called the mystic bonds of memory that makes us one people and keeps us together as one people is the target here. And Judaism, Israel's manifestation of Judaism as the essence of, of Jewish history, this is a critical target for this. This is, this is as long as it exists, it's, it's an un, uh, insurmountable obstacle for the left to get to their utterly destructive uh, future result. So again, I mean, I think, I think the idea is that, you know, Israel will be as, under assault by them so long as they exist yeah. unless they unless they are able to 
uh, repair themselves, you know, unless they're able to come That's to right. the, their senses, unless they're able to, you know, I, I, I was, I was amazed. We, have, we should probably finish because this is is an is the news hour, and and we shouldn't go over too much. But it seems like every single election these days uh, is becoming the election that's going to be do or die. You know, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in France, whether it's in Germany, whether it's anywhere, people are aware that everything now hangs in the balance. I think that there's yes. an, a, that a lot of the polarization also that you're seeing in politics throughout the Western world and certainly in Israel as well, is because there is this there's this palpable understanding that we are engaged in a in a in a civil war. All of us, each society in its own way, are we going to be who we are or are we going to be something else? Are we are are we the rewritten history or are we the history that they're trying to rewrite? Who are we? What are we going to be? How are we going to organize ourselves into the future? And and in the United States, you certainly see it most fundamentally, but you see it all over the place. It just happens to be in the headlines in the United States. How are we going to educate our children? What values are we oh. trying to inculcate into them? I mean, this is the front page headlines in 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 all the major papers and all the major shows in the United States. You know, this is something that you could never imagine when when we were growing up in you know forty years ago or so. This is Things have fundamentally shifted. You know, you're right that when Huntington was writing in the 1990s, you could see it, but it was still incipient. I mean, the United States was still triumphant from from yeah. defeating the Soviet Union, and you know, people who had been aware of Soviet subversion for many many years were much more aware of the dangers. But most Americans weren't really aware of that, and most Americans believed that you know, like Fukuyama said, that you had come to the end of history. You know. That's right. And I think there was also complacence on those who believed in Western civilization. We looked at what was happening in the universities and the silliness that was going on there. And we thought it was rather amusing, not dangerous. Right. Until now, all of a sudden, we see how dangerous and deadly and serious it really was. Uh, so part of the fault is the complacence on our side and the understanding that there was a war that the left of the, the, the progressive left has been waging a war. And every single thing they do is, is part, is a battle in a campaign. And you don't take battles lightly. And they didn't, and we did. And so we lost all these battles. And now, finally, uh, some on our side are beginning to realize uh, that Western civilization is on the table. It is under threat. This is a, a relentless war being waged on it. Uh, and that we have to win these battles and that we also have allies on the moderate left that, that can help us. But but more than that, the, the, the progressive attack on the West is a war, not a political preference. And uh, once you realize that battles acquire a very different meaning. And you know, every election is a battle then. You're right. We, uh, we should probably end it at that, but I'll just say, you know, one, uh, you have these sort of, it's not nice to say, but I mean, if you're going to be crass about it, you have a lot of gas bags who are reaching positions of prominence all over the world, all over the Western world, in Israel, in America, and anywhere else. And a lot of these people, you know, you raise your you raise your eyebrow and you say, who who is this gas bag? What what is she talking about? Or what is he talking about? And but I, we have a we have a we have a politician like that who. Uh, in in the in Likud party, who everybody always makes fun of. Her name is Mary Regev, but she she has a loose tongue and she says a lot of things that that uh, you know you could probably put more delicately if if you really put put your mind to it. But um, she doesn't back down. And I was talking about and and I and that's her strength. I was talking about it with my husband the other day. I said the thing that you know about Regev is that she knows which side her bread is buttered on. And she knows that she has to get the votes of the Likud voters in the Likud primaries. And she always is speaking to them, no matter where she is, no matter what microphone she's speaking into, she's always speaking to her voters. And that's how you know that she's not going to betray you, because she never forgets who sent her to the Knesset. She never forgets who she's representing. I don't know what she believes and whether she believes everything that she says or not. Maybe, maybe not. But what I do believe is that she knows that she has to keep faith with her voters, and that makes her a very credible 
politician in my mind. I think that it's important for people to know that they can trust their politicians because they know that their politicians believe that they have accountability to their voters. And, um, you know, you're going to get a lot more of that, I guess, as it goes along. And it's a shame, but it is the way it is. We've gotten to a point where, like you said, the battle has been joined very belatedly uh, by the by the right, by the nationalists, by the patriots, by whatever you want to call them, conservatives. Uh, but uh, you just can't back down in any of them. The stakes are too high. You can't back down on Sudan. You can't back down on, on designated terrorist organizations. You can't back down on, on advancing your rights as a people to your land, whether the land is uh, Loudoun County, Virginia, or or uh, Gush Etzion in, in Judea. It doesn't matter where you are. You just you can't back down anymore. And it's a shame, but that is where we've come to. Right, which is why the demonization of those who don't back down is so prevalent on the left right now is whether it's President Trump or Mary Regev or so forth, uh, those who don't back down are the big enemy now from them because they, they're scared of them. Which is good. They, and, and I think we should we should just uh, we should all just be brave and not worry about what people say about us because everything is on the line now. All right, well, I appreciate I appreciate this. I know that our 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 viewers, my viewers, were so happy to have you on the show yesterday. One person said that you're the most intelligent Jew in the world and and I would have to say that well, you know, there are there are a lot of really smart Jews, but uh, David well, I, Walker I is to, definitely I had, one of them. I had to come back to disprove them. <laughs> oh no, so far so far you haven't. So you're going to have to get another chance at it. But okay. Anyway, all right. Well, thanks again for being on the show and thank yeah. you guys for watching us and again share it. Spread the word, get it out. Carolyn Glick Middle East News Hour, you're going to get you're going to get the news analyzed uh in a way that you're not going to get anywhere else ever. So, come back to us next week. Come back and subscribe and and share. Take care. Thank you so much David. Thank you so much to all involved. And of course, to our viewers and listeners.